Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. It's Bim Thoughts time. Bim Thoughts time. Bim Thoughts time. It's time for all the cool cats and kittens to get their Bim Thoughts on. Because Carl likes it when I say cool cats and kittens. I don't know why, but he does. But we uh, we put up with it because Carl is the best. So, Carl is here, as you know, and so is Dana DeFilippi. I got her name right. I say it all the time now because I know how to say it. It's a miracle. We're also joined by John Pearson. Hey, John. How are things? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. How's everyone doing? Great. Wonderful. Tubular. Yeah, what Bill said. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, last time I chatted, it's been on this podcast. It's it's probably we talked about email, and it was probably three years ago. Wow, email! What the heck? We talked to a dynamo maniac about email for <laughs> how to manage email. So that was that's been a while, and uh... it has been a while because because <laughs> no one uses email anymore. There we go. <laughs> except for us old fogies. Everyone else is on Teams or Slack or. Discord is where I think where the cool kids are hanging out these days. There you go. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. What do I know? I'm just a cool cat. So, John, redefine yourself. These days, I'm found mostly toying around in code uh, when it comes to Revit or Dynamo. Um, uh -huh. I work for a consultant called Parallax Team and do general BIM consulting and programming. So everything from Dynamo to full Revit add-ins. Um, is where wow. I find myself these days. So, hmm. yep. <laughs> what do you do outside of the Dynamo world? So outside of the Dynamo world, um, we, uh, my wife and I, we like to take our dog um, places. So we live in the Austin, Texas area right now. Oh, so okay. we like to take him out, and there's a lot of cool uh, rivers and water around to run around uh, with him. He's a wow. he's a lab, a black lab. So uh, he loves water. So it's been a that's what we do on the side, and then. Aside from that, we uh, we like to wrench around on cars, so we have old Volkswagens that we work on in our oh, free yeah? time as well. Yeah. How many Gias? Uh, we don't have a Gia. We have a '64 Bug and a '79 Bus. Um, we have friends wow. with Gias though, and Gias are really cool. <laughs> Gias are you my have fave. friends. <laughs> yeah, and I do have friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we have a we have a friend with a '69 Gia that's wow. pretty cool. There, it's like a neat little sports car looking car. If you haven't seen them, <laughs> they're, they're yeah. fun cars. They are fun cars. I had a a uh, Austin Healey Sprite for a while. Oh, nice. <laughs> a 1967. <laughs> nice. A nice little car. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I'm sure Dana's ears perked up a little bit when you were talking about your dog. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Well, I love cars and dogs. So I didn't realize that John and I had way more things in common. Who knew? Wow. <laughs> so go. what kind of Volkswagens do you have? Yeah, so it's the uh, it's the Beetle or the Bug. Um that one uh 1964. So that one's uh just a, you know, kind of regular. It, if people see it, they think of Herbie probably. And then the other one's a 79 camper van, so a hippie van kind of. <laughs> That um, that is so awesome. I definitely want one of those. You yeah, take that a dog one around in that. Yeah, he loves that uh that the bus, the van, because he just hops in it and he can stand right between us while we're driving to go camping or whatever. So that he like adorable. gets a front row seat. <laughs> so he loves it. I actually have my dog tattooed on my arm. Oh wow, nice. He's a he's a twelve year old guy. I've had him since college. I actually got him in Blacksburg. He's a country dog, born on a mm. farm. And this lady just gave him to me at a grocery store for free. And we've been best That's friends awesome. ever since. Yeah. That is awesome. Wow. And he's 12? He's, he's 12. He's amazing. So he's going deaf. I have to, mm -hmm. like, startle him sometimes and, um, <laughs> you know, like, come over to him and wake him up. And he gets come somewhat startled. But he's he's a great guy. And I he's a little bit vocal. He likes to whine a bit. But mm -hmm. he's awesome. I yeah, am dog. a big fan. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. What's your dog's name? So our dog's name is Zero. Um, and I joke around and tell people that he's a 2014 uh, Black Lab. 
Uh, so he's six <laughs> years old. Um, yeah, his name's Zero. That's from Nightmare Before Christmas, if anyone knows. Oh, so that, I thought you meant course. Zero as in like he's your first dog because you're a programmer. Oh, see, that's the other joke too. But yeah, it was yeah. Uh, that's the joke you can make too. But he's uh, his name's from Zero, the dog from, <laughs> from the movie. <laughs> the little skeletal dog. He's so cute. There you go. <laughs> so what's new in the Dynamo world these days? It's always changing, of course, right? So how many I mean, packages are you up to? How many are you managing at this point? So at this point, what I'm uh, managing actively uh, is Rhythm for Dynamo. That's like the main one I'm known for. Um, what I've really gotten into over the last few years is um, view extensions. So they're actual add-ins on top of Dynamo and not just packages of nodes. Um, mm -hmm. So one that I spend a ton of time in is called Monocle, um, which some people may be aware of or or not. <laughs> Um, it allows you Speaking to do of things. dogs. Yeah, that one has a ton of the <laughs> the the doge or dog or whatever it's pronounced like. Um, I thought it was so, doggy, actually. Yeah, I've seen all of them, and and Gavin. Uh, what is it? He's, what do you call it? I call it doge. The doge noted. <laughs> yeah, so I I don't really know if that's right or not, but uh, there's a guy. His name's uh, his blog is Aussie Bim Guru, and he just did a. A post on it too and he said doggy and someone said isn't it pronounced some other way and he's like i don't know it's all crazy so <laughs> well who we're gonna have to get the guy that's that made it from scratch on and find out there you go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> work there on that go. carl i'll see what i can do i'll see what i can do i know a guy i knows a guy it's okay. a cute little shiba inu yep <laughs> that that is what i use that specific tool the doge is that what it's called am i saying it correctly now uh, I I'm not gonna say <laughs> yes or no. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm gonna have to listen to this recording just to hear how it's said. Um, <laughs> I use it for every single one of my scripts. That's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, Monocle was born out of frustration with uh, building Dynamo graphs because you start to use custom nodes and things like that, and then you hand off the graph to the next guy or gal, and they don't know what packages you use, and all the nodes turn red and yellow and they lose all their faith in your Dynamo graph. So like I set out to build a tool that would actually start to document that stuff. And initially I was told that you couldn't do it and that stuff's not stored in Dynamo and all that kind of stuff. So when I built it, I had fun with it on purpose because it's kind of absurd, the UI, but it's doing a lot of really cool stuff on the background. It's actually rather complicated. It was rather complicated to figure out the background stuff. So I just, I made a really crappy UI so that way like, you would forgive the UI and appreciate the the tool. <laughs> if you set the bar low, it's easy to just improve, I guess, right? Right. <laughs> right. But yeah, that uh I've been spending a lot of my time dynamo development wise inside of Monocle. So like I add a bunch of functionality to it that just makes Dynamo better from stuff that I've seen that I want, like alignments and a lot of O C D kind of things go into Monocle actually. So cleaning up node layouts and things like that. Um, so it's kind of funny. <laughs> um, other than that, other packages, um, I have one that's actually getting absorbed by the Dynamo team, uh, probably in the next few releases called Bang. Um, I was it, wondering when that would happen. Yeah, so that one actually handles Revit warnings. So if you have a model with a lot of warnings, this helps you mitigate those. Uh, they're actually adding all those nodes to the Dynamo Revit nodes right now. Um, I'm surprised you can see it, it, took on their it. GitHub. took them so long, a few versions. It really did. It's been out since Revit 18 <laughs> came out because that's when they added the API for it. Um, so now they're starting to add them. So it'll stay relevant for another year or so, and then eventually it'll be old news and the out-of-the-box nodes will replace it. So it's it's kind of sad to see the package go, but at the same time, it's an achievement because it is getting absorbed, which is pretty neat. And just, just to clarify, the, the package is called BANG! Yeah, there you go. It's got the exclamation <laughs> point at the end. We got, we got to make sure we get that right. Yep. Absolutely. That's Carl's favorite one because uh, at my AU. Favorite at, <laughs> my favorite joke. My favorite joke. You woke a lot of people up at AU with that uh, as well. <laughs> and and my wife in the office one one row over. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and me. You woke us all up. You woke us there all you go. up. Good job, yeah, Carl. Yeah, that's kind of where I've been for Dino de uh, Dynamo development uh, lately. You work pretty cause... closely with the uh, development team, though, for Dynamo right out on us. 
Yeah. So uh, a lot of um, what I'll do is I'll do a lot of the documentation. So over the last year or two, I, I helped um, update like the Dynamo Primer, uh, which a lot of people are probably familiar with, and the Dynamo Learn videos, the beginner videos. I actually redid all of those. Um, so the, it was a, they were scopes of work through contract, um, but yeah, we were able to kind of get that stuff updated through, through them. So it was really cool. And aside from that kind of work, uh, I just, I'm always on the Dynamo team's GitHub and posting issues and bringing stuff up and just giving them feedback to just kind of as like a, like a voice of all the users, because, um, I've found building software and tools that when you're the one building it, sometimes it's hard to see how people will use it. So I always try to make sure I, I voice what I see, like when I'm teaching people Dynamo and things too. So um, same thing with the Dynamo forums. I try to be on there all the time and bring up stuff and help people too. Would you say a good amount of your work gets absorbed by by Autodesk in terms of the, the packages you create, the nodes that, that are in there? Uh, so far, uh, I think it's a new initiative that they're doing. So uh, Bang's a big one. Uh, for Rhythm, uh, there's a few that looks like they are starting to look at bringing in. So I'm tracking those on GitHub as well. Um, so all of that's public, by the way. So like I get that question a lot. People are like, hey, you're sharing too much. And I'm like, it's on GitHub, open source, <laughs> publicly available. So, you know, um, there's there's a on my GitHub repo, I actually have a whole list called future deprecation list of the stuff from Rhythm that'll disappear in the future because they're doing it. So this is probably the first time I've really seen a lot of my nodes start to get looked at. In the past, I've seen a package clockwork. A lot of uh, his nodes get looked at as well and absorbed. They actually did a whole big um, initiative for Dynamo 1.0 where they took a lot of clockworks nodes and added them. So it's kind of it's kind of neat. When I started Rhythm, I didn't really know what the heck I was doing at all. Um, I didn't know how to code really yet at all. Um, so for four years down the road, I'm building tools that are starting to get absorbed, which is kind of, it's kind of cool to look back at it. Like if you look back at my GitHub profile, you'll see my, my frequency just increased over the years of how much code I've put up there. So it's kind of cool. It's like your own resume up there. That's kind of an excellent point. So I did a presentation at AU last year as well. There's this great quote from Adam Savage, um, from Mythbusters. And it says, if you don't, if you don't talk about what you can do, no one will know. So in terms of open source, if there's anyone out there listening and they're afraid of sharing what they're building, um, you're not going to lose anything for the most part if you just make it open source and share it. Because like you said, Dana, it is like a uh, resume for you. So uh, the specific quote from him is, no one will know what you can do if you don't talk about it. And when you have like open source packages or tools, uh, you're, you're kind of talking about it without talking about it, which is cool. I have been on the, I've been on the watching the Adam Savage tested YouTube channel lately. Oh, nice! That's a great channel. Just yeah, to... I was checking it out for Spot, the Boston, um, yeah, the robotics dog. Uh, he had one that <laughs> we had. We had one of the the Spotteers, I guess we can call. Them. I'll come <laughs> up with that term. They can use it if they want. Free there term. you go. We had one of those on the on the podcast a little while ago. Talking we did. That's right. Spot. Yeah, I've forgotten his name already. Brian Ringley. Brian Ringley. That's right. So Brian was on. You can check that out. Awesome. Yeah, but the test that the the stuff that that he does is just like he makes some great things. And what's interesting about Adam is, um, or Mr. Savage, I really don't know him, um, is he doesn't profess to be a expert in anything he just goes and makes stuff which is really mm -hmm. cool sort of like what i'm trying to do with the the great mojave rover i'm not com professing to be an expert but i'm going to certainly show people how to make a mars rover thing either work or not work <laughs> there you go for sure right right well that's awesome i am definitely of the mindset of sharing and i think that's something that kind of makes our community so great. I think that the, the people that we have contributing to the forums and the fact that, you know, I, and I tell that to people when I'm teaching them Dynamo is, hey, you're the, the, the community is there, post if you have questions, Google stuff, you know, because the community is so great, you're going to see really great responses and, and, you know, search 
searches to what you're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. But I have worked at firms in the past, unfortunately, that really don't like it when you share stuff. Um, have you ever had to go through that experience or what would you say, I guess, to to those types of people? Is it like, oh, well, maybe you should just do coding on the side as well, um, you know, outside of work? And, and maybe that is where the bulk of your work has come from, John. For sure. Yeah. So in regards to like not sharing things, I, I, I've seen that quite a bit and i used to work property, at a if you will yes i worked at an architecture firm a number of years ago as well and uh i was really like kind of privileged there too because um the bin manager at the time was pretty open to sharing uh things to an extent so it was really cool that's kind of what got me started on that path uh, that being said there were certain things that needed to stay within so you just uh, my feedback to people always is just try to balance it. So if certain parts can be like open and shared, like if you're doing like an AU presentation or a built presentation, you just kind of pick and choose what you can, you know, and try to share what you can. Um, in terms of actually open sourcing certain things, we get this question quite a bit at Parallax as well uh, about like rhythm. A lot of the nodes in rhythm are actually a result of Aaron Maller needing some functionality. So we have some stuff for um, dividing slabs and um, breaking up parts, parting slabs, parting walls. I never was going to build those nodes until he asked about them when I'd even work with him yet. Um, so I was like, oh, I need, I'll build you some nodes real quick to do this if you want. Um, I'll probably just put them in rhythm if that's okay. And he was like, oh, absolutely, do, do that. It's going to help me save time. So in his mind, he was saving all that time parting all these elements in Revit. Um, it being open source was secondary uh, to him. He didn't really, he didn't really care aside from that since it did save him so much time. So it is a balancing act as well, and, and we get those kind of questions a lot because we do work with some clients who want things to be private sometimes as well. Of course, um, a matter of fact, there's some extensions to Monocle that. Uh, are fairly internal to Parallax as well. So Monocle is primarily open source, but we do have some other things that piggyback on it uh, as well that we've used for a few things. So there's like bits and pieces where you have to balance it. Um, don't just go out and share stuff without telling people either, because that's not the way to go. <laughs> so that's uh, I I've seen people too are like, I'll just do it and apologize later. And it's like, eh, sometimes that strategy works, but don't don't just do that. I worked for a very uh, closed architect, one that um, in a previous job who did want to share anything. And what I discovered when you're like that, when you're closed like that, when it comes to new technology, you ramp up really, really fast and you think you're going in the right direction and you're, and you're just moving forward because you're, you're in, you're, everything is closed. It's all secret. It's all trade. You know, with the trade secrets, we don't want to tell any of our competitors what we're doing. And so we're laser focused on the way we're doing it. But over time, what happens is, is because you're so laser focused and you're so in your own little silo of this is the way you do things, because this is the whatever way it is that you do things, you don't look at what everyone else is doing. And you don't share what you're doing, and thus you don't get anything else that anyone else is doing that they're sharing with you. And so you don't expand. You mm -hmm. become very narrow, and you start doing things over and over and over again the same way. And what I find is, over time, you start to fall behind. Even though you had that big head start at the beginning, and you were like, okay, we're, we've got this competitive advantage now. Over time that competitive advantage goes away because now you're behind because you haven't shared and you haven't advanced. Mm -hmm. It's it's true. It's very true. Whenever you're, it's kind of interesting too, because as a consultant, I've been on the other side of things where I'm in between uh, several different firms. Um, I'll have firm A telling me we're the only ones who have ever done this. And then mm -hmm. next week I'll have a meeting with firm B or C and they're like, oh, we've been doing this for years. We're the only firm that does this. And I'm like, firm A last week said the same thing. So like, yeah. it's kind of funny when people think that they're, they're, they have something so proprietary. Sometimes 
I mean, we all think a lot alike a lot of the time. So it's mm -hmm. sometimes other people, it might be a great process, but other people figured it out as well. So, I mean. <laughs> right. And they figured out a better way to do it. Yeah. And sometimes when you are willing to talk about it, people will weigh in and you can take back those little bits and pieces that just make you better. So like mm -hmm. even at something like an AU or a built event, uh, you're there just talking about how you handle uh, multifamily housing models, for instance. But you get in a great sidebar conversation with someone about how they handled them. And mm -hmm. it's just when you're willing to kind of play along, it's kind of everyone benefits, really. Yeah. In fact, that uh, place I was at, we didn't really go much to conventions or mm. user conferences because we were so it was such a closed environment as opposed to the open environment that we have today where we share things. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I've seen that too. So, mm -hmm. so you really don't know what the other people are doing because you're not, they're not interested in you knowing that or, or they're afraid that you'll share something that is a competitive advantage. For sure. The way I always look at it also is you're also kind of making the firm look like a superstar, right? Like if I go to a major conference and I present and I share this awesome idea that we came up with and, mm -hmm. you know, go through the process and, and all that. Not only am I, you know, making myself look smarter, hopefully, but I'm making the company look great too, right? So For it's sure. like a marketing endeavor. Absolutely. Like when I started getting into presenting at conferences, it was 2015 for, at the time it was RTC uh, North America. Um, we we were doing like lighting analysis and a bunch of energy analysis stuff at the firm I was at. And it resulted in case studies through Autodesk for them and a whole lot of cool marketing as well. And then along the way, I was learning for one. And then I was presenting at this conference and it was my first presentation. And like I started to, to meet people and know people in the industry beyond like the four walls of my firm. So it was really cool um, marketing all around. Right. Right. Well, I think one of the things that, that I've heard from people that run up against the idea that, you know, we want to keep all of our IP, our internal stuff inside, is that if you think about it, if you go to something like a conference, like a built or an AU, and you take part in an, a round table, and you, you give away one little nugget of wisdom from your company, well, if there's 24 people on that round table, you're going to get 23 other nuggets of wisdom. So, I mean, the, the, the ROI on that is is pretty big. So, I mean, it, it certainly helps to drive home the fact that, you know, sharing is caring, as you would say, you know, mm -hmm. that uh, you need to get it back and forth. So sometimes you just got to open people's eyes to it a little bit, but it doesn't always work. I, I've been on that side of the fence as well. Sides of the fence. <laughs> In terms of code for sharing, it's kind of interesting. So as I've gotten more into coding as well, I've Naturally, when you're like on GitHub, for instance, when you build a repository to store code, it tells you to pick a license <laughs> for yeah. what your code's licensed under. So like a whole topic of like coding I never really thought I'd get into is reading what licenses really mean. So like uh, when it comes to some of what you share, you're able to license it several ways. Some of it's, oh, I license this for free for people to use, but they can't sell it if they were to bundle it up. Mm -hmm. uh, as something else or a license to share it as long as they reference your original code. So it's kind of unique. Um, anyone like listening to like pay attention to some of the Dynamo packages that you use, some of the licenses, uh, because there were a few interesting ones out there a few years ago that um, that were a little surprising with how the license was. <laughs> right. And I wonder if, they, if those weird licenses were picked because they didn't really understand what the licenses were. And they yeah, just I, picked one. I think that's a, there's a good chance of that. Uh, there's mm -hmm. at least one that I know of that's, um, I think the license was picked because it sounded restrictive enough, but in the fine print, it was like, you can't use this on anything commercially. And it was like, whoa, what, <laughs> like, what is yeah. it? What is, what does that word commercial mean in the context of the AC right. industry? <laughs> right. What is that? That That's a good question. What does that mean? Does that mean I can't use the code? to sell code commercially or does that mean I can't use it to make money in creating a uh, set of plans right it's it's a very interesting um, line that we start yeah. to get into <laughs> so which which um, 
I'm going to ask you which which licensing modes do you use the most, or which? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So generally speaking, uh, for anything on GitHub, um, the primary one. So like Carl and I actually collaborated on a project at Built mm-hmm. last year uh, for a hackathon. Uh, that license was MIT. So that one's mm-hmm. super permissive. It's kind of says do whatever you want. We just can't warranty this product. Mm. Um, Or you can't hold us liable if it crashes on you. So that's kind of what the MIT license is. A lot of stuff in Dynamo is MIT. Uh, Another one I really like to use for uh, like Rhythm is this license. It's uh, it's called, and I'll pull it up. It's the BSD3 clause. Um, So all it is is a license that says that its limitation is liability and warranty. But it has a third clause that says if you build something with this code, you can't sell it and say John endorses this product. <laughs> oh, so that's that's kind of what's interesting about that one is that third clause that says uh, you can't say this is endorsed by X Y Z, which is mm-hmm. kind of interesting too. Mm. But they still have the the permission to use that code to further a new product. They just can't say I built this widget and John says it's awesome. Yeah, exactly. So it's definitely it's per- permissive to allow it for commercial use, modification. You can change it, remix it, whatever you want to do. You just can't turn around and say like this is an approved app by blah blah blah. So that one's that one's kind of interesting. Uh there's also licenses too that say you can't go turn around and sell this code within something else. Uh that's one I don't use a whole lot. Uh-huh. Uh, for anything but it, it is a, a option out there for people if they didn't want someone to take their like let's say dynamo package and make it a paid plugin or something <laughs> what about um like the one i i would like to have and i haven't read them all and i should is you can use this for whatever you want to use it for it's just that uh you need to you need to uh, give credit where credit is due kind of a code mm-hmm so the most of them are like that. Uh, mm-hmm. Creative Commons is great for licenses like that because Creative Commons lets you use it as long as you just kind of like give a shout out to the person, which mm-hmm. is really cool. Yeah. And are, are you able to create your own license, like within GitHub, for example, when it says pick a license, can you pick other and you know call it the the Doji license and give credit I'm... as long as you have a dog emoji? <laughs> I honestly believe you can pretty much do what you want. There's actually one called, um, and I won't say all of it, but it's called WTFPL. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's a permissive license that lets you do whatever the blank you want to do. <laughs> so it's kind of so it's kind of funny, you know. <laughs> There's some fun ones out there um, for sure. Mm-hmm. Nice. Speaking of of GitHub, um, I know back when you started your journey into working with packages and then getting into coding, um, you weren't on GitHub a lot and then you've, you've learned more about it and you've shared more stuff on there as open source. And I remember just recently seeing a, a tweet, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, John, 60 second Revit, once or twice a month might go on Twitter, maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I saw a tweet about someone actually doing some pull requests and, and putting stuff back into the rhythm repository oh for sure so yeah i mean it being open source and on github that means if someone wants to it's called um it's like creating a local file in revit so you have a central file you create a local local file and synchronize right um people can create what's called a fork of your code and then push that back into the main one that you own so it's really cool because um if someone sees something they want to add or fix they can do that so for rhythm we actually had, um, his name's Micah. Uh, you, you probably know him. He always is at events too. Um, yep. He actually submitted some new nodes for Rhythm. It's one of the first times someone's actually submitted new nodes. Um, so he made a, a pull request, uh, aka like a sync with central with my code. And I was able to merge that. And we have some new nodes in Dynamo because of it. Hmm. Uh, even if you don't know how to code though, on GitHub, you can go on there and report issues and put requests and things like that. Um, and it helps us track it as well. It's a very easy way to track. It's You can track things kind of like if you've ever used like Trello or, or Kanban, like management practices as well. Very cool. Very cool. And and I know that you did a, was it last year or the year before where you did this session on, on GitHub? 
Yeah, so there's actually an AU session from 2018 that I did on getting started with GitHub as a Revit user. Uh, if you Google how to use GitHub, it's all for people who code. So like that whole class, we relate it all back to Revit terms. So like I just said, like you create like your local file and then you synchronize and then you relinquish, you know, like all those kind of terms. Uh, there's a lot of parallels in coding as there are in Revit. You can parallel a lot of it, which is cool. Well, and I think that's that's part of the, as Dana said, the I'm going to say coolness because for whatever reason, I can't think of a better term, but of the AAC community that, you know, two years ago, you did a class on GitHub a few years ago that may not have been something that people in the industry really wanted to get into, but being able to teach it in a way that it draws back to something that most people knew, in this case, Revit, um, it just shows that you don't have to be a computer science major to understand enough to get into that and move forward. And that, you know, we don't all have to be expert coders to understand enough to know this is something that's small, can save me some time, I can tweak it and move forward versus, okay, this really isn't something I should be dabbling with, I'll go get the, go get me a, a profesh um, <laughs> to carry on with that. So I, I think the industry is definitely changing and uh, you know where it used to be, architects shouldn't learn how to code or designers is the case maybe, I think that's, uh, that sentiment or that thought is changing. For sure. And even in that class, I, I I demonstrated how to use GitHub to save your Dynamo graphs. It wasn't even like full-blown code. You were able to upload a .dyn and see the changes as you add nodes. So, it, I mean, you can even use it to store your... I, I stored the whole presentation on GitHub for that class. So, like, my PowerPoint, my slides, everything was on there uh, while I developed the class. And I used that as my, like, synchronize... Uh, um, for my PowerPoint and everything. So it was kind of cool. It was kind of like uh, Autodesk uses this term a lot where it's like you're 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 eating your own dog food because you're showing people how great this thing is. Why not use it for your class, right? Very true. Very true. So yeah, uh, one thing I will warn people of and you probably saw this at built last year Carl was if you start using GitHub, you're going to immediately ask as a Revit user, why doesn't Revit do this? <laughs> <laughs> I want versions and I want to be able to merge changes and everyone working without the file crashing, you know? Uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if we, if we had it all, what would we complain about? There you go. Exactly. What's been the, your favorite tool that you've created, John? Your personal favorite. My personal favorite tool that I've built. I, I would probably say like my favorite thing I'm, I'm working on is a uh, is monocle a uh, monocle like I think I've learned the most building that because it's not just custom nodes it's actually changing how Dynamo looks and acts so it's kind of made me learn more about Dynamo too along the way and then I just have a lot of fun with that one I was watching um Gavin's video yesterday that I mentioned uh, once again he's the Aussie BIM guru um I was watching his video on YouTube and he's describing my tool and I'm watching it. And every time he mentions a tool, he kind of giggles because a lot of it's so goofy. So like I have stuff in there called custom node identifier TM and I added a TM just to do it. And when he said that, he like laughed. And then when he opens the the dog window, the package usage, he laughs too. So it's that one I think I have the, I, uh, makes me the most happy because I have so much fun building it and then seeing other people just be like, what the heck? You know, like, what's this guy thinking? <laughs> Uh, so that one's been a blast. And we've had people do video tutorials on Monocle in other languages too. And um, I think there was one in Spanish and the person was saying how weird it was to have the dog, but it's a useful tool. So it was kind of funny. <laughs> well, and I think the idea of having it be a little bit different, I know you've explained a couple of times reasoning why, um, but it makes it standard. I mean, it's it's inside a, a dynamo graph. It's not necessarily meant to be this thing that stands out in front of your big client presentation. So I think having a little bit of fun with it is a great idea. For sure. And uh, sometimes uh, it's kind of funny. It's had a, it's had a different effects on like uh, what I do professionally as well. So sometimes I'll build a really sleek, beautiful UI and I'm like, Oh, this tool is perfect. And then I'll show it to someone and they're like, Oh, you should add a meme to it or you should add this. And I'm like, oh, I worked so hard on this. UI. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like, 
I've had it go the other way on me too. It's where I'm like, I have this really nice thing and they're like, make it comic sans or do this. And I'm like, Oh darn. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> so it's been fun. <laughs> Dana, any final thoughts? Well, one question I have, and this has come up in the podcast quite a bit is, do you remember the first dynamo script you wrote? Oh, that's awesome. I, and I really like that question. Uh, my first one, um, well, first one I wrote on my own, I'll, I'll do first. Um, changing arrowhead types on text notes and tags. Um, and that was because we had a template that we rebuilt at the architecture firm I was at. And we had to change all of our arrowheads from 15 degree to 30 or something. And if you've ever changed arrowhead types in Revit, you know it sucks. Like doing Especially that manually all of the different things that have arrowheads right <laughs> absolutely so you have to edit type and it's a type parameter so like it'll drive you crazy so that was the first one i made that was really like the most useful before that though when i learned dynamo the first like actual graph that worked that i made uh, was in marcello's class um, dynamo for dummies where he showed how to make a footing follow a wall by doing a get parameter set parameter and that's what really told me you could do that. So then when I got back to the office, I was like, oh my gosh, we could set text note parameters. <laughs> you know, the, I could set the the darn arrowhead finally in batch, you know. Before that, I opened Dynamo, placed a node, it turned yellow, and then I closed Dynamo because I said I'll never be able to learn this. That was in 2014. <laughs> so that one's a story I always like to share too, is the first time I opened Dynamo, I, I remember saying to my my cubicle, like my neighbor, in my cubicle, I was like, I'm, I don't know if I'm ever going to learn this. And I closed it. And then a year later, I was in Marcelo's class learning it. So it was kind of cool. What was your first uh, Dynamo graph, Dana, that you're proud of? The occupancy one. That I and hers was on, she one? posted on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, it's on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, no, I, we all felt like a superhero, right? I'm sure, John, you felt like oh my god, I just changed a hundred different types of elements in Revit sure. and all of their arrow types. Like, I just saved myself a week worth of work, right? Absolutely. And then, like, for the next project, it needs to do this, and the next, and the next. And, yeah, I just wanted to share it, right? I mean, I think that's, like, the beauty no, of our sure. community, once again. The self-fist pump, all in a room all by yourself. Yes! <laughs> There you go. Yeah, luckily we don't have, well, unless you're like Carl and you have, you know, the wife next door. I guess, John, you do too, where you guys, <laughs> you know, when you do that, like, loud, yes, you know, you, like, scare uh -huh. the crap out of everybody. There you, you go. The I, I guess the dog. dog. I, I definitely yeah. scare the dog. <laughs> like I said, going deaf. Maybe that's why. Maybe that's why. Because yeah. <laughs> you're so successful. <laughs> it's very loud. Carl, you got anything else? I, I, I think we're we're at a at a great spot to end. I mean, John mentioned Comic Sans. That's that's usually where the 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 rim shot comes in, and we we uh, jazz hands off off into the sunset. Right. <laughs> I'm I'm waiting for someone to do a complete set of plans and uh, wing dings. There you I go. Mean... <laughs> oh, that's your next that's your next uh, Dynamo script add in um, uh -huh. that you get. You create it in some silly thing like wingdings. Oh, yeah, actually. And then you you get a, a magnifying glass, and when the magnifying glass goes over the wingdings, it converts it to regular text. Oh, wow. So it's like a, like a decoder. Oh, oh wow. That. That, that's pretty involved for sure. We, we actually oh, yeah. had uh, wingdings. That's why I said you should do it. <laughs> we actually had it in a, in a Dynamo script, though. Like if you had dimensions that were overridden, it changed it to wingdings. Um, <laughs> that was what we have used that for before because <laughs> it's like well if it's overridden it's useless so let's just make it wing beans and you know right and then put the username next to it of the person who did it there you go all right john thank you so much for joining us today oh for sure thanks for having thanks, me john. thanks john so they can where can people find you uh so twitter's really good um my username uh -huh. 60 second revit that ties back to my blog that i don't update as much as i used to but that's 60 second revit.com all spelled out um uh -huh. and then i mean parallax is the company i work for so i if you want to find me it's not incredibly difficult um i'm always on the dynamo forum too and things like that so 
Uh, and right. I would normally say uh, you'll see me at AU and Built and everything, but I guess you'll see me online maybe. And then next year, hopefully we're all back in person and able to yeah to say hi to everyone again. It'll get, it'll get back to normal soon enough. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, um, right. yep. feel free to reach out. And once again, I, I appreciate uh, all of you for having me on too. Yeah, we had a great time.